first let me say a few words on this lecture series. And actually, before I start, um, Monsignor asked me to let you know that this is Jack Jacqueline and Felipe, these are the two children that died in Border Patrol custody on the U.S.-Mexico border, which is a way to frame this talk, I think. So the CMS Board of Trustees, they established the Father Lidio F. Tomasi lecture in 2014 to be delivered each year at a CMS-hosted event by a leading scholar on a migration-related topic of pressing concern to faith communities. Father Lidio Tomasi, an Italian immigrant, is a founding member of a founding um, yeah member of the Center for Migration Studies, and he directed the center from 1968 to 2001. During his tenure, he founded Migration World magazine. He was also the editor of In Defense of the Alien, which was the annual series on the proceeding of a conference that was held in Washington D.C. on immigration law and policy. That event ultimately became the annual law and policy conference of clinic in Georgetown University and Migration Policy Institute. A distinguished uh, sociologist, Father Tomasi received many awards, degrees, and honors in his career. I'm not going to go through them. Um, let me say that past people that have given this lecture include uh, Father Alan Figueroa Deck, Maria Clara Lucchetti Bingamer and Hossman Espino, who's I hope here tonight, but is certainly here at the conference. We're really excited that um, Monsignor Arturo Benuelas and also um, Father Eduardo Fernandez are here to speak to us. Father Eduardo is the professor of pastoral theology and ministry at the Jesuit School of Theology at Santa Clara University. We definitely have the right people speaking on the right issue at the right time, really the perfect people. So let me say a few words of thanks to Father Kevin O'Brien, who in turn will introduce our speakers. Father O'Brien began serving as Dean of the Jesuit School of Theology in August of 2016. He joined Santa Clara University after serving eight years at Georgetown University, first as Executive Director of Campus Ministry, and then as Vice President for Mission and Ministry. He also lectured in Georgetown's Department of Theology. I was a theology major at Georgetown University, so I know it's a great department. In the area of ecclesiology, where he's awarded the Dorothy Brown Award for Excellence in Teaching in 2016, he's worked for Jesuit Refugee Service in Los Angeles and on the Arizona-Mexico border and served in India, Bolivia, Mexico, and Guatemala. Father um, graduated from Georgetown in 1988 with a degree in government. I should say that the Georgetown class of 1988 was a very distinguished class, although some would say it wasn't quite up to the level of the class of 84, but you know, who, who was when you think about it? In any event, Father O'Brien received a law degree at the University of Florida, where he served as editor of the Florida Law Review. He also earned a master's degree in philosophy from Fordham, a master's of divinity, and a licentiate in sacred theology from Weston School of Theology at Boston College. We're very grateful to Father O'Brien and the Jesuit School of Theology at Santa Clara for co-sponsoring this event. Uh, thank you, Don. Uh, I will be brief because we want to get to Arturo. Uh, the Jesuit School of Theology is one of the six schools of Santa Clara University, your host uh, for these days. Uh, we're located up in Berkeley because we are part of the Graduate Theological Union, this, this collection of nine schools of theology of different uh, Christian traditions. Um, we are deeply committed at the Jesuit School of Theology, in which we offer a variety of degrees, including an online master's in theology. Woo, if anyone is interested. Uh, we have a couple of our students, Camila, Victor, Anthony. Uh, they're, they're supposed to be in class right now, so this counts, right? Um, we have a deep commitment to contextual theology, which is doing theology always in dialogue with culture, with the times, trying to always bring in the questions, the hopes, the desires, the pain of the people of God, informing our questions, our, our search for answers at the Jesuit school, so that we can be partners with them in discerning the answers. Um, that's how we do theology. So it's uh, very appropriate that I introduce our two speakers um, who do theology and do their pastoring in that contextual kind of way. So our, 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 our Monsignor Arturo Benuelas is the pastor of St. Mark's Parish in El Paso. 
He, um, he was ruined for life when he studied with the Jesuits in Rome <laughs> at the Gregorian University in Rome, where he got his doctorate. He's the founding director of the Tepayek Institute, one of the largest Dawson ministry formation centers, training lady for parish ministry. He's widely recognized for his advocacy on behalf of farm workers and migrants um, and issues of life and justice on the border. He was co-founder of a very important academy of theologians, the Academy of Catholic Hispanic Theologians of the US, Actus, which has done great work in advancing um, Latino or Hispanic theology. And I think you taught one of the first courses in Latino theology at Berkeley, at the Jesuit school in 1991 or so. So he's really a father or a grandfather to many um, who are studying in the field. <laughs> Perdón. <laughs> including uh, Eduardo Fernandez, who is from our faculty, a professor of pastoral theology and ministry at the Jesuit School of Theology. Um, he directs our doctoral program there, and he teaches in the field of liberation theology, uh, Latino theology, Mexican and Southwest Western history, social justice, and the celebration of sacraments in different contexts. So we're delighted to have both Arturo, who will speak for um, a few minutes, and then um, uh, to, uh, to Eduardo, who will uh, respond, and then we'll have a conversation. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. On February 17th, 2016, Pope Francis visited our border, bringing a message of solidarity and justice for immigrants. On February 11th, 2019, President Trump visited our border, bringing a message of division and xenophobia. The Pope's message was filled with gospel truths. The President's message was filled with distorted lies about immigrants in our border. Pope Francis called us to welcome, promote, protect, and integrate the immigrants. President wanted separation of families, deportations, return back of asylum seekers, elimination of DACA, and to build more border wall. Our Holy Father offered hope for humanity in our, in our compassion and solidarity with refugees. The President offered more fear to justify his absurd obsession with the border wall, a monument to hate and a countersign to the reign of God. These two conflicting visions of America and Christian values are played out every day in our ministry all along the US-Mexico border with significant consequences for human mobility and for our work. My home along the US-Mexico border now looks like a battleground. 6,000 troops are lining the border walls with concertina razor-sharp wire, and border agents are performing military-style exercises in full riot gear. The government's anti-immigrant narrative continues to scare, anger, and stir people to hate newcomers and to promote harsher enforcement policies which separate families, closes the door to immigrants to better provide for their family, increases the size and scope of the existing border wall, denies DACA students a place in our society, and detains youth in cages. All of this is morally wrong, deeply inhumane, fundamentally un-American, and unchristian. Those of us who live on the border can see that there is no national security threat. This is one of the safest areas in the country. At the border, when they come in, the migrants are fingerprinted, their data is run through Interpol, CBP, ICE, and FBI databases. Government checkpoints encircle our cities. Migrants are not criminals, and there is no invasion. These are basically good, decent human beings who want to provide a better future for their families. Projecting fear for political purposes dehumanizes, demonizes, and desensitizes us to the sufferings of the poor. There are 6,605 agents along our border. The cruel enforcement policies and the military presence foster a, a narrative of the immigrants as the enemy, giving the perception in the country of rampant lawlessness and crime on our border, and therefore their way of justifying militarization of our border. This is a political stunt by the White House. Today, the administration is, running, is returning asylum seekers back into Mexico to wait their turn for an appointment with ICE. This unjust policy has created migrant camps in Ciudad Juarez, which is not prepared to handle the influx of refugees. 
Now, in spite of the government's disgusting anti-immigrant policies, something new is exciting and exciting is happening and emerging from our border that gives meaning to our work and offers a theological focus. A new God talk, a new God walk is being articulated by the voices of the suffering immigrants seeking a more dignified life. They are the catechists and the theologians of this emerging way to talk about God, the self, other, and creation. The plight of the struggling immigrants is the privileged place for the manifestation of the unfolding plans of God for the coming reign of justice and peace in our world. Their voices is fashioning a new people, or voice fashioning a new humanity. Now here are some of those voices, some of which I heard in our parish hall when it was a refugee center. Re Reina, for, arrived from Guatemala, the country with the highest hunger rate in Central America. During the Civil War, her parents, brothers, and sisters were killed, and she still carries these excruciating wounds with her. To survive, she works for $1.40 a day in the fields, which is not enough to feed her four children. Every 15 days, if possible, she buys a chicken to feed them. This month, with great desperation, she mortgaged her house and land so she could move to come to the United States. Now, if she doesn't pay her loan, she's going to lose her land and her house. She arrived with one of her little daughters at one of our shelters with nothing but the pain of family separation and the hope of finding work to support her starving children. I was forced to leave to survive, she said. At a parish vigil in our parish, in support of families whose children were inhumanly and cruelly separated from their parents and placed in undisclosed location, we heard the agony of a young mother tell her heartbreaking story. Julia, Julia had a six-month-old baby, six-month-old baby, brutally and forcefully removed from her arms, and she didn't know where her baby was for eight months. Imagine the torture she endured being separated and not knowing how or where her baby was. She prayed desperately that her baby would be well and return to her soon. Finally, when the baby was returned, he suffered traumatic behaviors at that young age. Children in particular are paying the price for their ill-conceived policies and practices. This past December, in our border, two Guatemalan children, you see here on the screen, died while in the custody of Border Patrol. Jacqueline Cal, seven years old. Felipe Gomez, eight years old. Their situations are still under investigation. Jacqueline died because of a neglect by a culture of cruelty towards those, those criminal aliens, those criminal illegals, even if they're children. This anti-immigrant American media immediately blamed the father for bringing Jacqueline to the border some 2,000 miles from their home. Jacqueline was her father's favorite and was with him all the time. I was blessed to be with Jacqueline's father, Nelly, at the funeral home where we prayed, cried, and commended Jacqueline to the Lord. I asked Nelly after we finished if he wanted to return to Guatemala to bury his daughter, that we would help him make arrangements. And he said, yes, I would like to bury my daughter, but if I return, my other children will not have anything to eat. I visited with both Jacqueline because of the Hope Border Institute. I visited with both Jacqueline and Felipe's family in Guatemala in hopes of offering some consolation to the suffering mothers and their brothers and sisters. The mothers told me that both children were happy and healthy and happy to go with their fathers. Felipe, being the oldest of the boys, promised his mother that he would send her money to take care of her. We told the mothers that Jacqueline and Felipe had inspired many of us to greater solidarity with them and that the death of their children recommitted us to work for the human rights of refugees, especially for children. Our little martyrs live in our work for justice. And then I want to tell you about Susana, a young Salvadorian woman who for two months made the dangerous journey to our border, eating out of garbage cans, sleeping in parks, begging for food on the street corner, something she was not used to doing. She was assaulted by the cartels, which is why she arrived pregnant. I asked her why she did not return home after suffering so much. She confidently said, I will suffer whatever I have to because I know God has a better plan for my, fate, for my baby. 
We baptized her baby she named Esperanza, Hope. Julio, a 12-year-old boy from Honduras, came fleeing rampant gang violence in his village. And mi país, la vida no vale nada, she said. Por diez dólares te matan. In my country, life's not worth anything. For $10, they'll kill you. Thugs entered his house and killed his father, mother, and brother. He knew they would come after him, so he ran away with only his clothes that he was wearing. He arrived at her shelter with no shoes and very hungry. He hadn't eaten in three days. He never had time to bury his father, his family, and he carried this affliction with him. No child should have to experience such deep trauma. Last week at breakfast, I asked a young Honduran father why he brought his nine little old girl, year old girl, along with him because it's a long and treacherous journey to the US. And he said, I take full responsibility for bringing my little girl. And then he said, o vivimos o no morimos. I had to risk it because we either die or we live. And I took the risk so that my family could live. These are some of the important voices crying out through their suffering for a new way to credibly talk about God and credibly live a new vision of justice in the world. Human rights violations in the countries of origin are the cause of forced migration. It is essential, and because of our work, that the human rights of immigrants are protected upon their arrival at our border. And it is also imperative that we focus on human rights violations as a cause and not just a consequence of migration. With Hope Border Institute, we visited Guatemala last month and witnessed what is saw, and we saw and we heard, and we were told and we saw what is very emblematic in all of Central America. Life-threatening poverty, extreme hunger, lack of school teachers, medical bondage with scarcity of health care, relentless death threats, dreadful nonstop violence, victimization by organized crime, inadequate one-room dirt floors for, for, for persons of eight people in one room, displacement of land by corporations like the African palm industry, shameful government corruption, servitude with undignified low wages and long working hours, repression and the trauma as an effect of civil war. These are basic human rights not afforded the poor, so they are forced to leave to survive. For us, people of faith, the plight of the immigrants is the point of departure for the manifestation and unfolding of the saving plans of God among us. The struggling immigrants seeking a new life beyond their suffering call us to a special encounter of solidarity that goes beyond empathy and charity. My indigenous ancestors, in their wisdom, teach us the meaning of this encounter of solidarity. They say, tu eres mi otro yo, you are my other self. We are all intimately interrelated, interdependent, and essentially a part of each, sacred part of each other. Tu eres mi otro yo binds us so closely together that if I hurt you, I hurt myself. And if I let your light shine, mine shines all the brighter. Minutes from my house, you can drive along the US-Mexico border, and you can see a disgusting 18-foot high border wall a racially motivated, politically charged symbol of hate, fear, division, and death. Every year, more than 400 immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers die in the desert trying to cross our border. I have had too many funerals. This horrible wall will cl clearly says, we do not want to be a part of you or you a part of us. Rechazo que tú seas parte de mi, mi otro yo. Now, support for this divisive wall comes first from our inner walls, which exist in our lifestyles. Short-sighted biases and attitudes expressed light in our anti-immigrant sentiment. They're rapists and criminals in our racially racist propaganda against people different from us. We are superior to people of color. Exclusion of LGBT persons. How can that be normal love? support of the Muslim ban. They're all terrorists. Influ indifference towards the poor. They just need to get a job. Careless towards our common home and sacred earth. Climate change is a hoax. Harassment and exploitation of women in the workplace. They should be home baking cookies. 
uncritical support of the NRA. Guns don't kill people, people do. Our disproportionate incarceration of people of color, that's where the crime is. The worship of individualistic ego, I have to take care of me first. And the growing gap between the rich and the poor, a rising tide will lift all boats. The walls between us threaten our sacred bonds. The prophet Isaiah and the Gospel of Luke proclaim the mission of the Messiah. I have been anointed, says Jesus, to bring you the good news, incarnate, tu eres mi otro yo. This is an incarnational encounter of solidarity. When we are in solidarity with each other, we open ourselves to this anointing, and our oneness is made sacred. Oneness with each other is oneness with God. Jesus teaches us the first step in living profoundly this sacred solidarity in taking our place alongside the suffering poor who daily suffer to survive. Remember, there is no conversion to God if there is no conversion to the poor. Through their eyes, we see what Jesus sees, a life rich in beauty and value and meaning. Solidarity means that the poor immigrants for us are not just those people. They're Juan and Maria and Susana and Diego. They need to eat at our table and we need to eat at their table. If, you do not, if we do not know a person, a poor person personally, we are missing the opportunity to meet Jesus among us. This is why our encounter of solidarity is more than just charity and empathy. Many people help immigrants. They serve them at shelters, cook their food, legally advocate for them, even give them money to, to go home. But then when they finish, they go home and they're the same. And all they say is an empathetic response. Oh, how I'm grateful to God for what I have that others don't have. This is not solidarity because for those persons, the immigrants are those people we help. It is not tu eres mi otro yo. Real solidarity takes us out of our comfort zones into the actual sufferings and hopes of the immigrants. When we make our own the plight of the immigrants, their struggles, their dreams, we go to a sacred place in our hearts where we begin to ask the deeper questions. What does my lifestyle have anything to do with their sufferings? And then this becomes transformative for us. A real encounter of solidarity is always mutual. And this mutuality, we become part of each other. We learn from each other and we both become more. This is tu eres mi otro yo in its truest sense. Sometimes, for example, we help immigrants as clients in our offices but we do not share our dinner table with them as friends. Tu eres mi otro yo is our banner of solidarity, global solidarity. It is an act of nonviolent resistance because to remain silent is to give voice to hate and fear. Our lives shrivel when we remain silent in the face of the sufferings of others. We are in the lucha together, not as neutral bystanders, but as artisans of a new humanity and a new history. Tu eres mi otro yo is an act of love that makes public action on behalf, <clears throat> on behalf of the common good of all, especially the poor. Political solidarity is the face of love and our advocacy becomes an act of rebellion in favor of human rights and human dignity. Tu eres mi otro yo is a spiritual invitation to embrace our differences as gifts that enrich our lives that make us better, fuller, and more valued human beings. It is a prayer that draws us into the awesome mystery of God among us today so that we allow ourselves to be raptured by this mystery, this mysterium tremendum et fascinans, and thus be able to see the human face of Christ in the faces of the suffering poor. It is, as Pope Francis says, a lifestyle of holiness and social justice. This encounter of solidarity is what transforms us into prophets, missionaries, and mystics of a vibrant, credible gospel. It is a lived courage hope, not afraid to take a stand, knowing that every time you take a stand, you're pulling, you're pulling a brick out of the wall of injustice until it all comes tumbling down, and then we erase all divisions among us, and then we can build a global human communion, una familia unida. And then all of this becomes an anticipatory celebration and a eschatological fiesta 
to celebrate the possibilities of real love and new life. An encounter of solidarity with refugees is our response to the Jesus question, can you drink of the cup that I will drink? Can you drink of the cup filled with blood, human rights violations, racism, sufferings, the pain of hungry children, families being separated, awaiting asylum in cold wire cages, and demonized persons considered non-human? In solidarity, we drink of this cup because it is a drink that leads to new resurrected life. And then we will see in the immigrants the faces of Easter and the promises of hope. Jesus Christ, the migrant Messiah, reveals to us that God has chosen to meet us and to save humanity through the poor, the refugees, the marginalized, the rejected of our sacred planet. We need to go through the poor to enter God's plans for justice and peace. There is an innate part of God in each of us that needs to be honored and respected always. When we listen with our hearts and share in solidarity with the sufferings and struggles and hopes and dreams of the poor, our lives are shaped anew. Our ministry finds its deepest meaning and our passion for living explodes into shouts of joy and a new person and a new humanity is born. Tu eres mi otro yo grounds the quest of the poor person for self-realization. All freedoms, human rights, human dignity, social justice, advocacy and reconciliation efforts are grounded first on tu eres mi otro yo, the solidarity of our sacred oneness. In our encounters of solidarity with the refugees, we can see beyond what is going on in the world, and we can see what God is doing in the world, and we can see that God is bringing his plans to fulfillment, and when you can see that, you can see that justice is coming, and you can see that peace is on its way, it's marching to us, and then we commit ourselves to that movement of grace in history. Now, sometimes, at immigrant conferences, I hear discussions of immigrant fatigue, and wondering if things are ever going to get better. Claro que sí, of course they are, because we have a profound conviction in the victory of Jesus Christ over injustices. The future is filled with God's blessings, and we celebrate it in anticipation beyond those problems. We are not people of doom and gloom. We are missionaries. We are prophets, and we are mystics of God's plan. We live a profound conviction that in all things Jesus wins, I know we're not blind to evil, and we're not blind to the problems, but we believe with St. Paul, where there is sin, grace all the more abounds. So for us then, hope means that racism and walls and fear will not determine the future of God's plans. And so we never give up. We keep fighting, but we keep fighting with hope. Now, one, one more thing I want to mention. I also want to mention that our gathering here and your work your great work in solidarity with immigrants is about something much bigger than just immigration. Again, you know the data, the policies that need to be addressed. We talked about them all day. The refugees are challenging white supremacy, xenophobia, intolerance, and all basic racism. Fear destroys us, embracing differences enrich us. They're challenging our economic models of greed of the market world with their progressive win-win programs masquerading as development for the poor. If you buy a pair of tennis shoes, I'm gonna give another person in a poor country another pair of, of, of shoes as well. This is socialism for the rich because the poor remain poor and the rich get richer. They're challenging our politics. Nativism and corruption are an attack on global democracy because it always includes the human rights of the poorest. They're challenging our religion. The Bible teaches us that we are made in the image of God, but we have turned God into our own self-centered images to justify our individualism and indifference towards the poor, those disposable of the world, and challenging our values. Who are we as a nation that professes the promise of life, liberty, and justice for all? With your significant work grounded on tu eres mi otro yo, you are challenging the status quo to fashion a new humanity filled with God's justice human rights, peace, and love. 
Your vital work is part of an historical fight, a global movement of justice, empowering the poor, the poor refugees to finesse, if not redefine who we are as a nation and what our vision is going to be. At one of the shelters, a young boy, Diego, from El Salvador was being beaten on his way here, and now we put him in the bus so he could go to Tennessee. Before leaving, he gave me a big hug and he says, gracias por mi futuro. Thanks for my future. He was thanking all of you, thanking all of you for your work. The struggling refugees at the border are giving us a full plate. We've talked about that today. Reunification of families. Infants as young as five months are still being detained in ice cages. The coyotes have a lucrative business with their traficante, the personas humanas. I am a little, I'm concerned about the negative narrative of immigrants portrayed as criminals and not ever talk about the contributions that they are making. Others complain immigrants do not assimilate, yet say nothing about those who still fly the Confederate flag. The reality is that immigration is at a 50-year low, and the majority of immigrants are here because they overstay their visa. Much work needs to be done to challenge government policies toward Central America, the turn a blind eye to the poor, to drug smugglers, and the trabajo sucio of the organ sellers. You've studied the issues, you know the conclusions, you know the solutions. Our solutions are many, but they need to include advocating for legal status, proposing laws that protect our sacred earth, comprehensive immigration reform, safe entry of asylum seekers and refugees, family reunification priority, just foreign and economic policies, dealing with the demand for drugs on this side of the border, stopping the coyote business, addressing the pro-government evangelicals, admission and atonement of two centuries of interference in hemispheric eternal politics, and confronting racism that fuels the anti-immigrant sentiment. To conclude, I want to thank you for helping us minister along the border and for your dedication in promoting solidarity and human rights and human dignity. I have been inspired by your work and your service to the poor. I pray that this day will be a renewed commitment to live faithfully your calling, your sacred calling, to live in the solidarity of our sacred oneness with God and each other. Father James Martin has a biblical prayer. He says, Jesus never said, feed the hungry only if you have papers, clothe the naked only if they are from your country, welcome the stranger only if there's zero risk, help the poor only if it's convenient, love your neighbor only if he looks like you. This is how we build a vision in a world sin fronteras opresivas y con puentes de esperanza. While the White House may be spreading falsehoods of, of doom because of the immigrants and their presence in our country. We are actually going through a Kairos moment. And we, I mean, we already have a lot of things to celebrate, a lot of new laws. The DACA students are the highest ranking achievers and innovators, especially in math, in math and science. 33 Nobel Peace Prize winners. Today, there is more support in this country than ever before for immigrant support and immigration reform. Now more people have quoted this verse than ever and more people are familiar with it. The Gospel of Matthew, I was a foreigner and you welcomed me. We have banners everywhere. Last month for the first time, congressional, we had a congressional visit in our border detention facility to investigate the deaths of children. The Pope and the bishops in the Americas are working to make a priority on care for immigrants. The poor struggling immigrants keep the president awake at night. The poor are shaping the cultural landscape of communities around our country with new friendships, new foods, new cultural celebrations, new family values, so many other things we can celebrate. Roberto went through our Paris citizenship program until he became a US citizen. His native born son now owns a restaurant where he works. He expresses his happiness and gratitude every day by helping other immigrants. He wants to do this until he dies. Takes food, and takes him to the airport, gives him back, and he says, thank you, and thank all the wonderful people who have blessed, helped me come to this special moment in my life. He said, in my country, we were starving. Please tell everyone, Father, for people not to be afraid of us. We are not a burden, we are a blessing. And I said, yes, you're not a burden, but a privilege. Father Dan Berrigan was asked, what do you want written on your tombstone? And he said, may he never rest in peace. 
this is all of us. We are not, we will not rest. We will not rest until immigration and immigrant reform and justice for immigrants reigns in our land. Let tu eres mi otro yo continue to fashion a vision for your work and your ministry. Tonight challenges us to build communities of hope in which people are not afraid of each other, in which they become welcoming communities that embrace differences. Tonight challenges us to a greater resistance that will not allow racism to become normal, where we can engage people to make a bigger table and not a taller wall, and where suffering humanity can aspire not so much to the American dream as to the kingdom dream. Victory is ours, folks. We're going to win this one. We're going to win this one. All your work and all the stuff we talk about in immigration reform, we're going, to win. we're going to win. I feel totally confident that on immigration reform, we will win. We will win. Hope runs through our veins, and the cause of reform endures in our hearts. And to those who stand in the way of our work, we remind you that history is on the side of justice, and God is on the side of justice, and God is on our side. That's why we're going to win. We have marched too many miles, fought too many battles, shed too much blood, had taken too many hits, cried too many tears. And all of this has served to strengthen us and to be more passionate about our work. And so we're ready to do this work, all of us. And we're going to do it and whatever it takes. We're going to go to the, take our banner to, to the White House, to the President's desk, to Congress, to restaurants, to every home in the nation, because that's how we prepare for a victory celebration that is coming soon, because we're going to win this one. With the psalmist, I believe that we will see the greatness of the Lord in the land of the living. I feel honored to share this journey with you tonight. I am happy and proud to say to all of you, tú eres mi otro yo. Que Dios los bendiga y muchas gracias. It's lovely to see Arturo, how you haven't lost your ability to paint pictures for us that console us, that challenge us. And uh, as you were talking about the border, I, all these images kept coming back to me and I was just there for Christmas and I'm going to share a little bit about that. But it reminded me about how important it is that the battle for justice be fought on different fronts. We're not all going to be doing the same thing. And Dr. Martin Luther King used to say that. And so it reminded me of just your life, of, of that importance of the, not separating the pastoral from the academic. And, and how important it has been for us in the academy to always stay in touch with communities and keep our ear to the ground and listen to what God is doing there. But I must confess, as you, as you mentioned, uh, Trump's visit and Pope Francis's visit, and I thought about how the places where they actually were right by the river is probably about five minutes apart along the border highway there. And when Trump was, he spoke at the Colosseum. And so my sister sent me a text that was so funny, and it was something like this. Isn't it interesting, Eddie? Our President Trump is at the Colosseum, remember? We used to go to the circus there. <laughs> and you know what else, Eddie? Across the Colosseum is the El Paso Zoo. <laughs> On uh, Christmas Eve, for the last probably 24 years, I've been privileged to spend Christmas Eve at Annunciation House. Annunciation House was founded about 40 years. Is that right, Arturo? 40 years. Uh, and it was during the Central American War. And uh, Ruben Garcia tells the story about how he got on the phone when he was director of Catholic, uh, the CYO, the Youth for the Diocese. And he got on the phone to Mother Teresa and asked her if she would come and speak in El Paso. And she did. And then, and then Ruben said, I think I feel a call to go and work with you in India. And Mother Teresa said, Ruben, 
Maybe your call is here on the border. Maybe that's how you were to announce the gospel. So they opened up this house that is still open, this refugee sanctuary house called Annunciation House. And as I was saying, every Christmas Eve, uh, it's been our pleasure to have a posada there. And at first it was very, very difficult, I must be honest with you. Because can you imagine, it's Christmas Eve, you're doing the posada, so you have uh, a little Joseph, a little Mary, little angels, sometimes little sheep, and you're singing these songs back and forth about please let us in, you know, my wife just had a baby or she's about to give birth, and there they are, and they're the ones singing, and the doors get slammed, and then we go elsewhere. But what has moved me every year about that was that for, the, for after the gospel is proclaimed, the, the story and the shepherds are always there, then we have a candle and we hold it up and we pass it around and we say, despite the darkness, who is your light this Christmas? And I'll never forget little Juan. Little Juan was, I don't know if he was a shepherd or St. Joseph, but he was driving me crazy because he kept taking his thing off and he wouldn't do what he was supposed to do. And then when we said, share your light, well, little Juan raised his hand. And so I put him on the chair and he held up the candle. And I thought, oh my God, this is like one of those Pepito jokes. If any of you know the Pepito jokes, Pepito always says the most crazy things. So little Juan says, my light this Christmas is that God gave me a new little brother. And he's right over there in that corner with my mama. It's that kind of hope. It's that kind of hope you, you have shared with us, Arturo, that, that gives us hope and reminds us. But this last Christmas, so it's about 3 o'clock. The posada was going to start about 4. And Ruben says, we can't have the posada. Why? Why, Ruben? Because last night, I left 300 people at the Greyhound station. And they're all sleeping on the floor. And the Greyhound station has to run their business. So we have to do a real posada. So, and he said, and they didn't let me know. And if they would have let me know, we would have provided for these people. Well, that week, ICE left 1,600 people just out on the street. But in no time, Ruben and, and people like you, Arturo, the parish, St. Mark's, other places receive these persons. But what I found so touching, and this is where I think there's, you know, we all have to be converted always continuously this business of good guys and bad guys to be honest with you sometimes i was ashamed of being from the border because i think when we grow up on the border especially on the u.s side we're always drawing the line and you told me recently arturo and this meant so much to me you said i i keep hearing that you never deny that you're from the border and i thought wow you, you don't realize all the richness that is there where you are growing up and why do i say that because it was so moving to me. This is Christmas Eve. Think about families and volunteers and all these things. But what happened? People made a room. They made space. So it, it, I thought, wow, you know, maybe, maybe there's more goodness in my city than I ever realized. And then I thought historically, there has been this relationship between El Paso and Ciudad Juarez forever. We really need each other. And I keep thinking about what a blessing Juarez has been for us. How in terms of helping us to preserve our cultures. When I was a kid, we had lost kind of the sense of the posada. Our pastor invited some young people from Ciudad Juarez. They came over with their guitars, with their piñatas, with their dulces. In no time, we were learning how to celebrate the posada. So it's this sense about we need each other. And, and I think what you've said that's so important for us is to remember hope. Hope, not to lose sight of this. There's a, there's a wonderful saying in Spanish, there's a fly on top of a plow, and let me say it in Spanish first. The fly says, estamos arando, we are plowing. And sometimes we forget that we're that little fly and we take ourselves so seriously. And I think what people there, uh, has taught, what people at the border have taught me is you never lose hope. Siempre hay que tener esperanza. You name your child baby esperanza, as you told us. Solidarity. We need each other. 
We need each other. You know what amazes me is, is, is what you told us, Arturo, in terms of, of the, the facts, right, about the border and immigration and so forth. It's a no-brainer. Last year, uh, a social ethicist, Bill O'Neill, and I taught a course on migrant theology and ministry. And we had all these statistics. And we were blessed that in the class there were about 24 students from about seven different countries. Among them, some from Asian countries, some from African countries. And, and it was so rich to hear that kind of sharing there. I guess what, what, what amazed me was the stuff is there. It's a no-brainer. It, you see the, manip the, manipula the manipulation that is taking place, and the facts are there to defy what we are being told. The last thing I want to say is that I think sometimes we underestimate that sometimes we are hosts, but sometimes we have to be guests. And that's really important to learn how to be both. I think the one who has taught me this is Jose Antonio Zavala, who during the uh, Civil War in, in El Salvador came, and he was the first resident at the Oakland Catholic Worker. You might have heard Bob LaSalle today, one of the founders of that. And so, so Jose Antonio, uh, we invited him to our class, and his wife, Rosita, who works at the, at the Jesuit house, washing dishes. And we asked them what it was like to be in the refugee camps. And what did they, what did they most remember? And so they told some stories, but then they said, you know, we really loved it when the volunteers would come and visit with us and just spend time with us. They were the hosts. They were welcoming the volunteers. Let us not forget that. Finally, the last thing, and you alluded to this, it's a slow, slow process. And when we Jesuits were thinking about what are we gonna do along, the, along our province, especially around El Paso right there, how are we gonna beef up what we're doing from a parish right there, one block from the border, Sagrado Corazon? One of the Mexican Jesuits told me something that still haunts me. He said, make sure that what you do can bring some success. Porque los norteamericanos les gusta mucho tener éxito. Because from the people from the U.S. love to have success. You know, we're doers. We're proud that we can go in and fix it. He said, this is a long, slow, slow process. Arturo, thank you for reminding us of that, that it's a long process. Thank you for reminding us of the passion. Thank you for reminding us that we are only collaborators and that God's in charge and the importance of not allowing ourselves to get burned out. It's too important. It's the reign of God. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arturo. I see the uh, uh, Trump line about building the fence. And I also look at Google Maps about the meander of the Rio Grande down in the uh, close to the Gulf of Mexico. And looking at it as an engineer, it's an impossible thing. You, you've got an area that takes care of itself and you're trying to cut a line through a meandering river without affecting people. And there was at least one pastor down there, a priest, I believe, who is bringing this out in the in public of, of trying to show the, the uh, insanity of trying to define uh, a, a border that was created by people who never we're anywhere near it. In the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, it just was a pick, pick a river and we'll, you take one side, we'll take the other side. 
uh, I don't hear that type of, a, of an argument. The, 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 the ridiculousness of trying to tame nature to establish a, uh, a, 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 a define a line in, in public and reaction there. The Sierra Club is fighting it. I know that. What? The Sierra Club is fighting that. Um, I just wanted to add that um, I ha I'm director of Catholic Charities in Small Diocese of Monterey, but I received an email from Bishop Sites of El Paso appealing to anyone. Um, they have an overwhelming need at the border in El Paso, and anybody who can speak. Uh, specifically, you know, Spanish, um, they're asking Catholic charities across the country for volunteers um, because they said they said the numbers have grown from an average of 300 a week to 300 a day, and we desperately want... 500 a day. 500 a day now, and there, he's asking all the diocese uh, Catholic charities who for volunteers, so I, I asked my staff, so I hope we, maybe I could send one or two, but it's... Um, they had made this plea to across the country to all Catholic charities dioceses um, yesterday, um, and I just wanted to add to that that you know on the environmental if it was if they were ducks that were trying to cross and being separated, we would not have the Americans would not have stood for that at all. They forget that humans are creatures too. So you know. It's just, and just uh, one point, Arturo, that, that one of the things that you've done is to have people actually go to those places. Uh, and, and so that's where, it, you know, you, you think you know the border, but you know one side of the border and part of that border. So for me, those kinds of experiences are really powerful, uh, because especially to have that contact, but physically to be present there. There's nothing like being in the desert during a sandstorm. Other questions or comments? Yes, one second. I'm going to take a shot at asking this, and I'm hoping that because you all have been in the dialogue with um, Notra, um, Notra Americanos, uh, so North American mm -hmm. United States folks, mm -hmm. longer than I have. Here's what I'm getting pushed back on, and I'm hoping that you all can help me with an appropriate answer. For the most part, um, we are a country of, that believe in the rule of law. And so we have laws, whether they're correct or incorrect, but there's a rule of law. So I get pushed back on two areas. One is overstaying visas and not showing up for hearings. So where there might be some empathy and sympathy for those who need assistance and want to be um, brought into and have their day in court, or they have been given a visa for a short period of time for whatever reason, they're not then following up on their side of it, which turns people off, and then they say, well, we can't trust them. We can't trust them to follow the rule of law or follow the rules, and therefore we have to do something more egregious. Can someone help me with that? Yeah, I want to answer See, for follow up, for follow up. Yeah, okay, it's a good question. Here's the thing uh, about that, because it's very real. Um, I don't think anybody would debate that we need laws. That that's not the issue. The issue is how unfairly those are applied to immigrants. If you want to get uh, uh, citizenship, you, know, you have to get in line for 18 years. You know? And so people keep saying, well, I'm not against immigrants. I just want them to do it legally. But they're not willing to change the law so that instead of 18 years, it could take 18 days. And it, ha it could do that. I've been in the process with people looking for their papers. And you go into one office and, and they, in a window, and they stamp your paper, and they say, come back in 16 months, give me $75. And then six months later, you come to another one, and they say, oh, this is not the form. I'll get you the form. Come back in three months and so forth, and you keep going back and forth. Now, if you've got a job and you've got to support a family and you've got to go across the border or you've got to go to Houston or if you've got to go somewhere else, uh, 
you're gonna lose money working, you can't support your family. So the process in itself is very unjust. And so, yeah, we should have a legal system, an easier way to um, get people their visas or get people their work permits or their citizenship. It's not that difficult if you, but the idea is that the system is rigged so that it discourages people from wanting to apply for visas or wanting to come into the United States. And so people say, well, I'm not against immigrants, I just want to do it legally, but they won't support a revision of the way people can legally apply for, for coming in, for asylum. Now, it also depends. In California, you know, asylum seekers have a, a better chance of, of, the, of a court date, whereas in other parts of the world, they won't. In El Paso, it's 2%, isn't it, Dylan? It's 2% of asylum that get granted. So you're not gonna, you know what I mean? You're not, you don't have a chance, there's no hope there. And then the other thing about uh, 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 showing up for your court date is that you're gonna get deported. <laughs> you already have a job, you have, you're established, you have a family, you, you know, you're established in the community, and, and, you, you, and you're supporting your family, and then you, you're gonna get deported and your family's gonna stay here in school, they've already got friends and stuff. And so the issue is not whether we should have you know, immigration law, the issue is that the immigration law is rigged against uh, helping the immigrants all along. And, and yeah, and then it's very expensive. It's very expensive. And now next year the fees are gonna go up, uh, $50. I and think. think about how unscrupulous lawyers, I know I'm in the law school, so I have to be very careful. <laughs> but unscrupulous ones, not, that, that they, they prey on these people. I mean, I, I have a friend from, from uh, Guatemala that they, uh, this lawyer kept scaring him. He ended up paying $15,000 and still the case was not solved. We finally all went to court and the judge asked him a few questions. It was an open and shut case because of when he came and how he had not left. And so I asked my friend who processes these cases, how much would it cost your office to do this? She said, one dollar. <laughs> The, the, I just want to mention also about that is I was in a situation where Ruben Garcia took somebody to court and the judge says, I want a, and with real filthy language, I want a good blank blank reason why I should let you and your diseases and your kind into my country. No, gone. That was it. There was no other discussion on that. So it's so subjective if the judge is in a good mood or in a bad mood. Again, your case is for immigration reform. We can do this better. Uh, you know, and we have to do it better. Thank you. Other, uh, I don't know if question. that answered your question. <laughs> Questions or? Um, I just had a little more, in, I work with clinic and we have some information on our website and, and I'm not an attorney, so I'm not gonna be able to give this the proper legal spin. But um, part of the problem with people not showing up for court is they just don't get notified often. Uh, we have a report on our website called uh, about in absentia deportation, people who are deported without ever having the chance to show up in court. It happens for a variety of reasons. Some, an immigrant will notify ICE that they are moving or they're gonna be staying with so-and-so, but ICE doesn't tell the immigration court system. And so the, the word never gets transferred and so the notification of your court date doesn't appear. And there are also a lot of problems that they've been seeing recently with, with um, separated families when they're released and told to go away and come back, they're given court dates in the jurisdiction from which they were released, which is probably in a border state. And maybe they're living in New Jersey, so there's gotta be a whole process to file for a change of venue. So there are a lot of legal things going on too that account for why people might not show up where the situations are out of their control. There's, like I said, there's info on our website. And some of the people did show up to court and they were deported right. and they were separated from their children who were still in detention centers and they didn't know where their children were, and they were told, we're going to unite you with your children. And they were not united with their children, so they accepted to go to court, and then they were deported without their children. That's going on. Okay. Thank you. Don? Yeah, I just, um, I, I thought I'd, well, first of all, thanks for that like, extraordinarily powerful talk. I thought that was <coughs> terrific, and I'll be remembering that for a long time, and. We'll have it posted too, so I think you know. I think it'll get a lot of attention. Um, but you know, just to answer the the legal question, I just present this to you. I mean, these are people that are 
fleeing for their lives, trying to make a better life for their children. You know, they're fleeing gang violence, the kind of terrible oppression and poverty that you that you saw in Guatemala and that the Scalabrini see where they work, et cetera, et cetera. And what happens? They cross a border illegally and they commit a misdemeanor. They commit a misdemeanor in doing that. And for the rest of their lives, they're branded as illegals. You know, I mean, that's not a case of the blameworthiness being about them breaking the law. It's really a case about the law breaking them and the law not working. And I mean, I think that that's the way that I would, um, I would answer that. If I leave today, jaywalk across the highway, commit a misdemeanor to do that, and I'm not prosecuted, nobody's calling me an illegal for the rest of my life, you know? I mean, and the consequences aren't that I'm going to be separated from my wife and children and lose my career and everything else, you know? Nothing's gonna happen and nobody's gonna care about it, but why do we care so much about, you know, these kinds of violations that are totally justified in terms, in the bigger scheme of things? That's, that's the way that I would, I would put it. And the other, I mean, the other point I think that's worth making is that um, where people have opportunities to obey the law, they do that. The, 10.6 million undocumented people, we know that 4 million of them actually are in line and have been tentatively approved for family-based visas, you know. They tell them to get in the back of the line, they are the line. That, that's, that's who the line is. So, I mean, there's a lot of ways to answer that question, I think. Just to follow up on that, I just want to, what are some other examples of misdemeanor? I mean, I, I've always tried to, so what, so jaywalking is one. So when you think of it, it's just a little. Yeah, they're minor. Some other things. Like well, overstaying a visa is not even a crime. Yeah, that's not a crime. Driving without a license. Driving without a license. It's a very common one because they can't have alcohol. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Um. Uh, so, so first off, thank you uh, for sharing that, and, and thank you for sharing the wisdom of, of your ancestors and for noting that. Um, I guess my question is, how do you keep your sanity? Uh, because this isn't, I mean, this isn't easy work. You know, this isn't, this isn't something that, that is easy to do day in and day out. It's incredibly traumatic. It's incredibly difficult. So, so how do you maintain your well-being? Um, Mother, other than just having faith, but how, how do you do it? <laughs> yeah, great question, Arturo. Thank you. <laughs> oh yeah, you're the one who has faith. Eduardo is insane. He's beyond repair. But <laughs> Arturo, how do you stay sane? Yeah. Several ways. Okay, I think the immigrants uh, and their stories and how I've shared in some of their journeys give me tremendous hope um, that go beyond my own problems and my own sufferings and make me search a little deeper in myself about why I want to be a priest, why do I want to minister in, a, in the most complex of situations, and that they can tell me, you've got to look beyond this moment of pain and suffering there's something coming along the way that God is bringing to fulfillment in our society and in our lives. And somehow that relates to how we celebrate Eucharist and how we pray and, and how we, the friends we hang out with. And, and there's a tremendous sense for me that, that God is present and doing something new and to see beyond the suffering. That, that's why I think the coming of the immigrants is a blessing to our country. It's a wave of hope. It's not an invasion. They're bringing to us a call to be more, to do more, to be more human, to be more alive, to be closer to God, and to use whatever you're about to bring about a new person, a new humanity. And they're putting it in your face, but they're doing it as gift and as blessing to me. And, and so it, it, I'm constantly being renewed by that and it gets me closer to God. I'm being renewed in, 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 I mean, they're a blessing in my life. They're not a problem. They're not even a headache. Yeah, so, 
Reuben called us in the middle of the night and said, I got, you know, 200 people here at the bus station. Uh, I need a place. Can you find a place? Vámonos. You know, and so I vamos. And you should have seen Reuben walking like Moses with all these immigrants coming. <laughs> with this to, and, to we, and I called somebody. I said, I need your hall, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, 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 and in one hour, we got 100 people volunteering, bringing clothes, food, like this, for 200 people like that. I mean, those are moments that inspire. You know, those are, those are people who, who call us to, to something more meaningful in our lives. And, and it, it re-energizes. Kind of, you know, it, it gives you that, that hope is is not wishful thinking, but the possibilities that we can be more, and that and that we could be called to be deeper in our in our spiritual lives and in our relationship with God and with each other, and and that it's the poor who don't have a, a theology book with them, you know, it's the poor who don't have a house, or and and they've got more to give me than, you know, than than anything I I own or possess, and so the the question is. You know, where do you get your hope, you know? <laughs> where do you get your hope, it's a question. And it's a question we discuss often. We discuss that, and I, when we visited the people in Guatemala, and, and we, we sat down with the people who work, that was my question to them. Where, where do you get hope from? You know, where's your hope from? And, and we keep learning, and I think the answer, I mean, there's many answers, of course, but one of them is that we have a tremendous font of inspiration from the struggling poor because they, have, they bring to us a call to be more. They bring to us a call to, be, uh, to, to respond. And, and, and see, the, for me, that's why being church is important, because we're not gonna be credible until that happens in your life. And that's why hope is so real. Easter is real for us, you know? That, that something new is happening, and, and beyond the problems and all the Trump and all the stuff we got, that's not gonna be the future. You know, and we're, estamos en la lucha, we're in there, we're in the struggle, but we're not in there because we don't think, be, we're in there because we know the ending. <laughs> you know, we know the ending, we know the victory, we know that, that, that evil's not going to win out. And so, in our being with each other, they learn from me, I learn from them, and we both feel more hopeful with each other. And so, we can hug each other with hope. You know what I mean? And, and I, I'm, I, I go home better. I go home fuller, you know? Listo pa más ganas. Listo pa darle más, you know? Más energías. That's one answer. There are many others. But I, I, I know that when, when I'm in prayer, it always includes something about immigrants. And I know, you know, and, and I know my parishioners are probably, yeah, enough with the sermons, you know? <laughs> enough with this immigrant stuff, preaches about something else. But there, there is, anyways, it's how we become prophets, and it's how we become mystics, and it's how we become missionaries. And, and something new is God's doing something new in our lives. And I see a new vibrancy in the church, and a new vibrancy in, in people like you who are doing this every day. I don't know if I answered the question. But That's... That's, okay, we have one last question. Oh, uh, what were you going to say? I just want to say thank you for giving us all such hope. Yeah. 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 Uh, so we have one last, we just have a couple more minutes. Anthony? Oh. <laughs> Jesus. Um, Monsignor um, Arturo, thank you so much for taking out of your time to talk to us. Um, it's, all that, Kevin, it's all Donald's fault. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> for making this problem. <laughs> Um, so I'm a theology student, so I do not study law, but so my question is going to be a little bit more specific towards my own reality. Um, from my experience, I see the church right now polarized, and I think you spoke on a lot of the topics that are actually dividing the church right now. However, I am, I am interested in knowing um, what is, from your experience, what is being done in the church to awaken and, and help seminarians and theologians become more conscious about what's happening right now? Because, you know, we talk a lot about contextual theology or systematic theology and all these amazing scholarly and academic themes, but then how are we getting connected to organizations that can actually bring us to the peripheries and to the real? Um, realities that are impacting lives. Since Father Ed is a, a professor of seminarians, I'll let him respond first. <laughs> <laughs> I have a 
class prepared. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I just find that a lot of times we're out there and sometimes we haven't done our own internal work. Uh, I remember Father Rom, who worked in, among uh, gang kids in South El Paso, a block from the border. And this guy, incredible guy, he had left the, uh, the El Paso and 30 years later they named the street after him. And I asked him, how did you do it, Harold, all those years? He's now in his 90s. He said, one day a week, I would ride horses with my friend in New Mexico, nearby. That there's something about stewardship and taking care of ourselves and doing our own interior work and processing. So we're finding out that you can do a million immersions, but if you don't prepare people for immersions, if you don't work with them after, forget it. You know, it, it's another experience I can put. So I'm, I'm a big believer in do your work. Do your spiritual work, your discernment work, your prayer. Find out what gives you life. Connect with people who give you life. Okay, last, uh, we have to, just a couple more minutes. Last question. Oh, this wasn't a question. It was more or like another comment. example of, uh, for example, a more concrete example would be like the, the Diocese of Yakima. Uh, all the seminarians are required to work with the migrant farm workers, I think it's in order to become priests. Obviously, you're not going to do that in a diocese where you don't have migrant farm workers. But that's just one example of how some dioceses are you know, taking uh, this seriously and making sure that the priests, or that the seminarians that are going to be priests, are also able to uh, understand the needs of, of those that are more, more ma marginalized. Well, it's been a, Don, it's been a long and, and full and rich day. There's much to reflect on. Um, we've heard, uh, in the United States at least, we've heard much uh, from, of, of El Paso through Beto O'Rourke running for president, perhaps. But maybe Arturo could run for president, right? I think he would have a lot of votes right here. Uh, with everything happening in the church now, um, I think this has given us great hope. So thanks, Eduardo, uh, for, for being president. But Arturo, most of all, thank you for being with us. Thank you.